Hello, I'm David Shaw from Fact-Based Insight. Quantum tech isn't just like any other new tech. Quantum mechanics is the most fundamental description of nature that we have. Full stop, no limitations. The new resources it offers, superposition, entanglement, quantum randomness, are driving the second quantum revolution. Quantum computing offers a new type of computation with applications beyond any classical technology. But it's not just computing. Quantum communications also offers a unique new tool set, not just the often discussed QKD, but also a wealth of other protocols. Quantum sensing offers remarkable sensitivity and its future role is often underappreciated. In this presentation, I want to show how these separate pillars are joined together in one overall quantum ecosystem in the short, medium and long term. Governments have big, increasingly geopolitical aspirations. Leading quantum companies are bullish. Management consultants have been banging the drum. Private capital is on the march. Tech advisory businesses are striving to sketch the shape of this new sector. I, I put this slide up not to discuss forecasts in detail, but just to flag that there's no shortage of numbers on this new market. And, and here I've only included ones from credible organizations with a real knowledge of quantum. The underlying question is how to put all of this in context. Sometimes these numbers differ because they're talking about different things. What exact segment? What definition of value? Sometimes they differ because of technical assumptions. What developments are required to remove a particular roadblock? What flows from that? Sometimes they differ commercially. What different businesses have different strategies? What's their business model? In this presentation, I want to show how an understanding of the quantum value chain can help these quest put these questions in perspective. Quantum tech is set to have a wide impact and an unusually diverse one. Let's start with this big picture of the global economy drawn roughly to scale in proportion to global GDP. Though the potential impacts of quantum computing are widespread, Notice that flagship applications such as cryptanalysis, breaking common current cryptographic codes such as the Internet's RSA and quantum simulation for material science or quantum chemistry, they will actually find direct use in fairly specific areas. Other potential applications such as using quantum linear algebra as an accelerator for machine learning has wide potential application. Machine learning is taking over the world after all. Optimization applications span particularly widely. It's a, ubiquitous, it's a ubiquitous hard business problem. Both of these are notable because they also address the large services sector. However, there are potential roadblocks. We'll consider these later. Because of the threat of that cryptanalysis, everyone now needs quantum safe cryptography. And because of harvest now decrypt later attacks, I do mean now. For most normal users, the new maths-based protocols of post-quantum cryptography will suffice. However, for users with enhanced security aspirations, interesting new quantum-enabled tools are also on the menu. Quantum sensing is also set to have a wide impact. This market can appear fragmented, but as we'll see, powerful connections are emerging across the quantum value chain. So I've mentioned value chain. What does that mean? <clears throat> Value chain analysis can actually be a confusing topic to gen up on. The usage of the term has moved very significantly from its original roots and the technique continues to get extended today by jobbing management consultants around the world. The original concept was introduced by Michael Porter focused and focused on the individual firm. Accountants could always tell you how much revenue was coming in and where the costs were going out and so what overall margin was being made. The value chain provided a framework to reason about where that value was really being created across each of the firm's activities. This proved a powerful tool to decide which activities were core versus what could be outsourced. However, the concept also naturally lends itself to looking at how value chains are connected across the wider industry supply chain. And indeed, many people use the terms supply chain and value chain fairly interchangeably. When we talk about the former, we're often emphasizing the operational linkages. When we talk about the latter, we're often emphasizing who's taking what share of the financial pie. This framework has often been useful for discussing different business model options, particularly where these involve different degrees of vertical or horizontal integration. More recently, the concept's been used to discuss global value chains and with a focus on how globalization moves value between different countries. 
This is naturally relevant to understanding how quantum first mover advantage might tilt outcomes for 21st century economies. To get a feel for value chains, let's look at some examples. Let's pick one that is anyway interesting to us as a likely heavy quantum end user. Here I show the life sciences and health value chains, drug discovery and manufacturing in pharma, and the use of these products in healthcare. Even at this top level, we can start to pick out segments where much of the current cost lies. Late stage clinical trials, manufacturing, treatment. We can also start to be more specific about where particular quantum use cases sit. And importantly, quantum tech is not the only thing driving change. Many think that developments such as advances in omic sequencing techniques and precision medicine, that's drugs and therapies much more specifically tailored to a smaller patient group, are already set to disrupt these value chains. Conventional machine learning techniques are already leading the charge on this. This isn't an alternative to quantum. Quantum is set to be a new powerful contribution to this emerging tool chain. This is also a useful way to see the impact of disruptive technology. This is where a new development is so radical that it threatens to disrupt the structure of the value chain and the business models it supports, not just incrementally change the, the segment margins. It's worth noting that in such cases, history teaches that it's often particularly difficult for large incumbents, incumbents to react in good time. Companies such as Odyssey Therapeutics, uh, Quantum SI, Protein Cure, and Google's isomorphic labs uh, are developing their own business models to exploit just this. <clears throat> Supporting many other value chains, of course, is the information technology value chain itself. It's going to be interesting to talk through this in some detail as it holds lessons for us. Back in the early days of computing, things were fairly simple. You had people who had figured out how to make interesting new components like Intel's 8088 processor. You had companies that assembled these into devices like the early IBM personal computer. Unknown startups like Microsoft developed the operating systems for these new machines. Others like Lotus Software, remember them, developed applications that businesses found useful. An alternative strategy was to keep the latter steps under one roof, and so was born the Apple Mac. You can see that companies at each stage in the value chain each have their own costs and revenues. They compete with rivals in their own value chain segment and implicitly with others along the value chain to secure a bigger share of the customer's end purse. Historically, many were surprised by how influential operating software proved in tilting the battlefield and how lucrative it could be to roll up the application sector. Apple's doing well today, but in this early phase, its full stack strategy didn't particularly shine and never has for B2B applications. Now let's wind the clock forward. The tech value chain has become much more sophisticated over time. Scale, specialization and globalization have defined many niche activities in the component segment. The, the rise of ubiquitous networking has enabled much greater specialization in computer hardware and completely new applications. Conventional operating systems have been joined by a host of middleware. Modern enterprise architectures typically put an emphasis on the separation of applications and data. Again, you can talk about costs, revenues, and value in all of these segments. But you also have to watch out for the new business models this has enabled. Integrated device manufacturers now compete with specialists pursuing fabless, foundry, or outsourced assembly and test models. Recently, the supply chain and geopolitical ramifications of this have increasingly come to the fore. Downstream, the internet and the pervasive convenience of cloud computing has enabled other new models. Infrastructure as a service aimed at system administrators, platform as a service aimed at developers, software as a service aimed at end users. It's important to be realistic that these business models, it's important to realize that these business models uh, chase margins and those margins have tended to migrate to the right, closest to the ownership of the user relationship. These new cloud markets are dominated by a diverse bunch. AWS, a former large user. Microsoft, Microsoft originally a systems uh, software specialist. Google, an algorithms company. And IBM, no longer a manufacturer of PCs. Hopefully that gives you a feel for how value chains work, how they evolve and how business model opportunities change. But before we talk about how quantum fits in and the quantum value chain itself, we have to go back and ask, what's really different about quantum? I don't have time today to start right at the beginning. 
Uh, we have a variety of quantum systems. The qubit is a useful abstraction for talking about these systems. Let me jump to some of the specifics that make a difference to the value chain. Uh, before it's measured, in general, a quantum system exists in a superposition of states. The electron is partly spinning up and partly spinning down. The trapped ion is partly in its ground state and partly in a particular excited state. For a two-level system, any particular pure superposition can be represented at a point on the surface of the block sphere. Now, the more subtle point I wanted to point out is what happens when we manipulate that superposition. In the absence of measurement, the qubit doesn't jump anywhere. The qubit state draws out a smooth path as it moves around the sphere. Here I've represented a qubit starting in the zero state and being manipulated around the sphere so it ends up again at zero. Or does it? You can see that it doesn't feel like the zero-one logic of digital computing. It feels more like an analog process. It's clear that noise is likely to knock the qubit off course so it doesn't get back exactly to zero. That's a challenge for quantum computing, so we should expect to see significant activities in the value chain dedicated to tasks such as calibration, correcting crosstalk, and in general coming up with clever optimal control strategies. But if the system is sensitive to environmental noise or disturbance, what if that noise is something we want to detect? That's the intuition that lets you see that quantum systems can make uniquely good sensors. Further, when the zero and one states are encoded on some fundamental physical object, like the energy levels of an atom, this is an absolute measure. Most of our physical units, including time itself, are now defined in this way. This built-in reference feature is a key additional advantage for advanced quantum, advanced quantum sensors. Entanglement is perhaps the slipperiest of all quantum concepts, but it's absolutely central. First, let's realize that entanglement is at the heart of the power of quantum computing. If I have unentangled qubits, it's no problem to write down their complete description in a conventional computer. However, if they are fully entangled, then I have to allow for all the possible permutations of the entanglement. This rapidly blows up out of control. Each additional qubit is an extra factor of two. Technically, this is an example of what we call an exponential increase. This is also why simulating quantum chemistry on a conventional computer is hard. Just for a single molecule, I have to write down a wave function that includes all the possible permutations. Penicillin is a molecule with only 41 atoms and 242 ground state electrons. A full conventional simulation would require more transistors than there are atoms in the observable universe. But on a quantum computer, just 300 qubits are thought to suffice, provided they have very, very high fidelity. But entanglement offers much more than that. If I have it, distance is no object. If I have a shared entanglement between two points, then I can use a technique called quantum teleportation to transfer a qubit from A to B simply by making a measurement at A and sending a short classical signal to B. It's not that generating this initial entanglement, this initial shared entanglement is easy, it isn't, it's very hard. But it's all that's required to unlock a remarkable toolkit. For communications, it offers inherent privacy. For sensing more subtly, it offers maximal coordination. What's profoundly important is that I can use this technique to continue the exponential multiplication of quantum computing across the network. A final key property to discuss is randomness. Classical physics just isn't. It's deterministic. When I know all the starting points, the initial conditions, I always know what's going to happen next. True, I can create systems that appear to behave chaotically, but underneath their behavior and biases are all behaving classically. When a quantum system is measured, it promptly collapses back to just one of the conventional classical states. In the case of a qubit, when I measure it, the result is simply zero or one. The cat is alive or dead. The result is random, but with a well-defined probability for each outcome. Now, it's important to realize that there is something very different about how these quantum probabilities work. Conventional probabilities are real numbers that always add up to 100%. 10% chance it's raining outside, 90% chance it isn't. In quantum mechanics, probabilities don't work like that. It's the square of probability amplitudes that add to 100%. And the amplitudes are complex numbers. Why should we care about this crazy redefinition of probability? Because it's the way nature actually works. Nature may sometimes look simpler, but look closely enough, and this is always, always 
what's actually going on. If you need to model nature in detail, you need to be able to deal with the patterns, the interference effects this generates. Of course, this is also at the heart of the most basic security primitives of quantum comms, QRNG and QKD. Uh, but there's an important kicker here. This type of randomness has its own unique signature. Advanced protocols can test that what they're observing is genuinely quantum, and so genuinely random. No surprise then that the name of Continuum's new cyber security product is Quantum Origin. <clears throat> so let's put the pieces together uh, and form the quantum value chain. As a starting point, we have a wide variety of quantum systems that companies and academic groups are currently working with. The goal is to form these into qubits or other simple systems that can be easy, easily manipulated. But this high level view isn't going to be too useful. We have to break it out. Uh, yes, in each main pillar of quantum technology, hardware is a key building block, but there's also major steps requiring significant software engineering and computational science skills. And that's not just in quantum computing, but also in quantum communications and quantum sensing. Sensing includes time and in practice often means imaging. Significant specialist signal processing is typically required. We also mustn't forget about enabling technologies. And of course, as we highlighted earlier, we must understand where in the end user's own value chain we're playing. But this is still too high level a picture. A business case or startup investment needs to be assessed in its specific context. We need to understand potential roadblocks, what share of the prize we can potentially access and how that might evolve over time. We have to drill down further. This is a simplified view of connections across the quantum technology value chain. And yes, this is a very busy chart. The main point, although, is that it's already not very simple, but in fact, it's complicated in many rather ordinary ways. A starting point of connection for the wider quantum sector is a shared set of enabling technologies. Prominent are advanced fabrication techniques, already a globally contentious area, tier one fab supporting the conventional semiconductor industry have attracted their massive investment. And for what they do, they offer the highest levels of exquisite detail and reproducibility. But typically they emphasize the reproduction of established techniques at scale, not new processes and new materials. And they're very expensive places to do uh, R&D. Leading US players such as IBM and Rigetti have emphasized the advantage of having their own facilities. The Chinese are building facilities in Haifei and Yunnan. Players such as Cy Quantum have very different strategies here to players such as Xanadu or Quix. For quantum technology, what will be the winning combination of fab, capability, geopolitics and scale? Another point to note is the pervasive impact of photonics. Both as a quantum technology in its own right, but also as a key control and readout component for other systems. Photons are great at carrying quantum information because they can resist most conventional sources of noise. It's also worth keeping a weather eye on possible pinch points in the supply chain for strategic materials. Helium-3 is a key ingredient that gives uh, dilution fridges their exceptional cooling power. That's needed for quantum tech, such as superconducting circuits and others. And scaling up is likely to require more and more bigger and bigger fridges. But helium-3 is not something that's readily produced. It's a byproduct from the maintenance of nuclear weapon stockpiles and certain types of nuclear reactor, not your run-of-the-mill value chain step. Let's look in more detail at the emerging quantum computing hardware software stack and the challenges it faces. I've written recently in some detail about this, so I'll go fairly quickly. For more detail, check out factbasedinsight.com. The qubit plane itself is naturally special. Here we have to worry about the now familiar metrics of qubit lifetime, one qubit and two qubit gate fidelity. As we've seen, unlike digital bits, qubits are acutely vulnerable to error and they are operated by analog pulses that require careful calibration and optimal control. The control plane and the provision of control logic are central concerns. Functions that have long since been buried in the microarchitecture and firmware of conventional devices are still active software issues for quantum. Big questions such as how quantum error correction or quantum RAM will be managed still lives in the architectural twilight zone of the quantum stack. At the programming framework layer, the concepts of the circuit model typically dominate discussion, but it's not the only approach. Compared to conventional computing, optimizing compilers have access to a new range of strategies. Metrics like quantum volume and its newer cousin clops capture performance uh, to this level. It's also important to remember an additional element, 
simulators. It's easy to see that these are needed in the advance of genuine quantum hardware, but their future significance will continue. Real quantum software is going to be difficult to debug. Most of our usual approaches are ruled out by the laws of physics. Simulators are going to be a vital ongoing tool for software verification and validation. It's worth dwelling in particular on quantum algorithms. In a sense, these are the secret heart of quantum computing. It's not the computers that run faster, it's the algorithms that execute in less steps. Activity is hot here, but most new quantum algorithms are in fact variations on a relatively small number of underlying primitives. In the short term, in the NISC, noisy intermediate scale quantum era, we have to work with small gate count and low circuit depth before noise overwhelms the calculation. For gate model devices, the principal techniques employed are, are mostly flavors of the same underlying idea, variational quantum algorithms, including VQE, QAOA, quantum neural networks. Many have high hopes for what might be achieved here, but we have no real proof when or if a useful quantum advantage will be achieved. Similarly, quantum annealing is an interesting technique, but it too is a heuristic approach and must prove itself by trial and error. Once we can scale up devices and apply quantum error correction, FTQC, fault tolerant quantum computing machines, will be available. Here we know much more about what these machines will one day be capable of. The poster child, or perhaps poster demon application, uses the quantum Fourier transfer and Shor's algorithm to crack common cryptographic codes such as RSA. Before this application is ready, expect to see the world scramble to new forms of quantum safe cryptography. In my view, the real flagship application is using quantum computers to simulate other quantum systems, and in particular for applications in material science and in quantum chemistry. We do need to wait, though, for sufficiently large high-fidelity machines. The next big area is quantum speedups for linear algebra. This sounds like a very flexible tool with particular applications in machine learning. However, there are significant caveats. Typically, the data has to be available in QRAM, a technology that's still in its infancy. Also, the result is a quantum state, not the conventional solution of an equation. For me, there are two highlight areas of particular interest, quantum natural language processing and quantum machine learning with uniquely quantum data. Perhaps the most controversial area is optimization. This is particularly appealing because of the wider and pervasive nature of potential applications, not just in the industrial, but also the large services sector. At the end of the day, many practical business challenges come down to hard optimization problems. However, take care. The speed up promised here is only quadratic, much more modest than the exponential speed up offered elsewhere. That's also a lot less of an advantage for the quantum, uh, for the quantum algorithm as it seeks to claw back raw clock speed disadvantage. Conventional computers are typically a lot faster in terms of underlying clock speeds, perhaps dramatically so once the overheads of quantum error correction are taken into account. Several notable leading players and academic groups don't think that FTQC machines built within the limitations of current architectures will be usable for optimization problems. That's a massive part of the potential market. Others are keen to take up this challenge. D-Wave are bullish about the potential of of their quantum annealing approach. It's a completely different architecture, but that's an aspiration built on a heuristic and can't be guaranteed as proof against competition from quantum inspired digital annealers. In assessing hardware readiness, it's worth checking out the new algorithm oriented benchmarks published by QEDC. Let's look now at quantum communications. The protocol that many people have heard about here is QKD, quantum key distribution a new way of exchanging a secure cryptographic key between two points on a network. QKD is often presented as being in competition with PQC, post-quantum cryptography, which offers, a new maths, uh, offers new quantum resistant maths-based protocols. However, I don't think this, I think this is mischaracterized. Uh, for most general internet and normal business use, the all PQC solution is set to be the preferred choice, certainly in the short and medium term. However, it's also wrong to view all PQC techniques as offering uniformly high security. Math-based cryptography is based on computational assumptions. For lightweight implementations, it's lighter weight versions of PQC that are being proposed. For the most sensitive applications, the cost of a complementary layer of security may be justified. QKD works well in conjunction with PQC, and in the right use case can offer a uniquely enduring security promise. Another quantum primitive, QRNG, quantum random number generation, also combines well here. 
Simple compact Cure and G chips have already found their way into select mobile phones, high output devices into server racks. Several startups are already offering innovative security solutions based on new techniques for efficient out of band key delivery. However, it doesn't stop there. As we discussed earlier, quantum randomness can be characterized and tested for. This is opening up new possibilities. Continuum's quantum origin is a few qubit quantum computer application. When more powerful machines are available, and notably when I add techniques from PQC into the mix, we can potentially offer certified public random numbers. That's very interesting for applications such as energy efficient proof of stake blockchain. Uh, these are potentially just one of a new range of advanced quantum computing protocol, quantum communication protocols. Well, one I see particular promise for is blind quantum computing on the cloud, where even the remote server is doing, uh, where even the remote server doing the calculation can have no idea what you're working on. Once people appreciate what this is, I think we'll wonder how we ever did without it. Naturally, there's a whole network stack emerging to support these quantum communication aspirations. It's worth focusing for a moment on the battle of ideas that's underway here. Everyone agrees that the long-term vision is of a network able to share entanglement between any two locations. However, that still looks some way off. Many are focusing first on the simpler objective of building a network that is able to support, prepare and measure QKD. This basic form of the protocol doesn't require entanglement and has already been demonstrated at large scale in China. It can be built today using existing commercial technology though it does currently rely on the use of trusted nodes as intermediate stations. Some are pressing ahead, building out and commercializing this version of the network stack, a quantum enabled internet. They reason that entanglement distribution isn't coming anytime soon, and they'll gain sufficient commercial momentum in the meantime to lead a later technology migration. Another point of view is that we should build an all entanglement based stack for the true quantum internet now from the bottom up. You can be, see both strategies out there in the aspirations of different players in different countries. Quantum sensing. A wide variety of modalities can be sensed. Time itself is a big one. Gravity, acceleration, all forms of electromagnetic radiation, magnetic fields, the list goes on. This part of the ecosystem can feel different. Packaging up probes against particular deployment use cases is important, so it can feel more fragmented. Individual opportunities can feel more niche, but the potential is still huge. A big area of potential impact is in life sciences to enable new scientific and medical diagnostic techniques, including as an enabler for precision medicine. We can also see the value chain in action here. As an example, take uh, Circumagnetics. This uh, UK startup is pioneering a new wearable MEG scanner, a brain scanner. It images the magnetic fields in the brain in real time. This is also an early example of value chain disruption. Uh, the current market is served by an earlier quantum technology, squid-based MEG. Circa's OPM-based MEG promises to be much cheaper, uh, cheaper and easier to use in a clinical setting, radically changing and expanding the market. Circa haven't developed a new probe per se. What they've done is take vapor cell-based probes from another quantum startup, QSpin, and package them into a helmet, and crucially added the software to extract and process the signal. To make the protocol clinically deployable, magnetic shielding is required. Step in another value chain partner, Magnetic Shields Limited. Another big area is, is position, navigation and timing. We currently rely on GPS, or, or as it's generically called, GNSS, for much more than we think. Not just for our daily sat-nav fix, but also for logistic supply chains. Also ubiquitously for time synchronization within the many networks on which modern life depends telecoms and data networks, and even the electrical grid. But GPS is vulnerable to spoofing, to hostile action, and even to natural events such as, as solar flares. Better solutions for time sync, time holdover, and navigation in the absence of GPS are highly desirable. The military already has its own acronym for this, GNSS denied PNT. It's a common feature that many of these new sensing technologies are of interest to the military. But in time on a tradition, these sensors will also find civilian uses. From a long-term perspective, the quantum ecosystem connections here are also potentially profound. Personally, I think one of the most exciting developments across the field in 2021 was the proof of concept completed between Caltech and Google Quantum AI, demonstrating the exponential advantage that quantum machine learning can offer when it's directly pre-processing the coherent output of a quantum experiment. Or to put that more abstractly, when it's, when it's out processing the output of 
coherently networked quantum sensors. Some might observe, where is the quantum internet in this picture of the value chain? Well, in a, in a real sense, in the end, this is the quantum internet. Quantum computing devices, large and small, connected by a wide area entanglement-based quantum network. Is this a dream? Is there really a Bill's business case to build this? It's important to recall our earlier lesson about entanglement. When I build, when I network two conventional computers together, I get, well, two computers. When I network two quantum devices together, I get an exponential increase in their computing power. That's a massive win-win. In the long term, that's the business case that backstops the quantum internet. Even better, there are other great opportunities along the way. In addition, if we inhale deeply and at full strength, we can look for the synergy between coherently networked quantum sensors and quantum machine learning to drive this to be a true quantum internet of things. Thank you. I hope you found this presentation useful. If so, please check out factbasedinsight.com.